Good afternoon, Team Crew Light community, and welcome back to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole on the Russia-Ukraine War. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Crew Light Center, and as always, we are joined by our Russia subject matter expert, Dr. Yuval Weber. Uh, it's been a couple weeks, I think, since we did one, but we've uh, we've we've been building up some material in the last um, couple weeks in the interim with sort of more focus and more spotlight being put on the the very intensive fighting that's going on around the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, which we we talked about previously, but the situation seems to be getting a lot tenser, and there have there have been some some Russian advances in the city a little bit, but also sort of around the flanks, you know, which is going to put the city into a pretty precarious position. Um, but uh, for that, we we you know we got some late breaking news to cover here with you, um, sort of just in the last twenty four hours that we were not expecting to talk about, but because it's pretty fresh, we'll just we'll lead off lead off with that before we dive down into the um the the deeper issues around Bakhmut so you've all welcome um good to see you again and so what what is the first breaking news headline we're going to hit here today uh so the first breaking news uh comes to us from the Black Sea and when we say breaking uh it hit the wires rough a uh, little under an hour ago uh, from when we're recording on Tuesday afternoon and that is a uh Russian fighter jet has taken down uh, an American drone and allow me to read from uh, the tweets of Lara Siegelman. Um, so, and she is uh, quoting selectively from a, the European Command, the UCOM uh, statement earlier today. So for those who may not have heard or may have heard, but haven't looked into it by the time they're listening to this, uh, I'm now reading, quote, this morning, a Russian Su-27 aircraft struck the propeller of a US MQ-9 drone, causing US forces to have to bring down the MQ-9 down in international waters, according to uh, US UCOM. By the way, this is also like, uh, its trade name is the Reaper. Uh, it's a Reaper drone. So again, quote, several times before the collision, the SU-27 dumped fuel on and flew in front of the MQ-9 in a reckless, environmentally unsound and unprofessional manner. This incident demonstrates a lack of competence in addition to being unsafe and unprofessional. This follows a pattern of dangerous actions by Russian pilots while interacting with U.S. and allied aircraft over international airspace, including over the Black Sea. These aggressive actions by Russian aircrew are dangerous and could lead to miscalculation and unintended escalation, end quote. So, you're an aviator, not a drone pilot, not a fighter pilot, but you are a, you're a helicopter pilot, uh, but you are an aviator. What do we know about the uh, the rules of the road when they come in when they come in the air, and why exactly is this as why did DoD focus in on unsafe, uh, unsound, and unprofessional in their descriptions? Yeah. So uh, as we mentioned before, I'm gonna you know watch my language here because the very first reaction I have when I read through that description of how this particular interception went was it was stupid in a in a multi-layered tapestry of stupidity that I just I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head about like what could possibly be going through the pilot's mind in terms of how they they were trying to bring this this uh, this aircraft down so to, to rewind a little bit so I think in a previous, uh, maybe it was the last episode or relatively recently, but we, I think we had talked, no, actually it was with Dan Rice. We were talking about what China was up to in his broadcast a couple weeks back. We'd been talking about a Chinese interception that was done uh, against the U.S. Uh, na naval patrol aircraft. And um, now both Russian and Chinese fighter pilots have this track record of doing unsafe interception, um, uh, interception procedures against U.S. and allied or adversary aircraft in their from their perspective now um it's not to say that like to do an interception is not a it's not an illegal procedure like it, if you go into civilian handbooks for aviation like there are continental united states procedures for interceptions and then there are i'm ashamed i'm trying to remember the term anyway but there are international procedures for for interceptions as well right like there are times where you you may be told by another uh, military aircraft to divert where you're going for and for any number of reasons it could be it could be a criminal thing it could be I mean, it could be a safety of flight thing right like the for example looking back at when the the air force shot down that chinese balloon over 
over a training area. Had there been civilian aviation floating around that particular block of airspace and um, not necessarily aware that there was, there was an airspace restriction for them to do the shoot down on the drone, you might have had, say, an F-22 go, you know, do an interception with a civilian aircraft for safety of flight to just to keep it from going into there for its own good. Um, so there but there are well-established procedures for this because interception is deliberately putting objects in airspace that you normally try and deconflict. You're putting them on purpose very, very close together, which is a inherently risky thing to do. One, because again, we try and keep aircraft away from each other because when they collide, things don't go well for them as well for everything that's underneath them. But two, you have two aircraft who may have very different sets of, of airframe capabilities, different levels of experience, different levels of communication. You know, it's not like, you know, in a, in a military flying formation, which is also an inherently risky, but you've trained together, you know, each other's aircraft capabilities. You probably know the other pilot, right? Like it's a, you're, you're accepting higher risk because you're better at it and you've trained to it. And you know, you know a lot more about the other aircraft that's right near you than you do in a completely blind interception. Inherently risky, right? And because of that inherent risk, all the procedures are meant to do things nice and gentle and not get those aircraft any closer to each other than they absolutely have to. Which, as I said before, Russian Chinese fighter pilots, uh, they, they don't seem to care. Um, they're all about doing very aggressive, coming much closer than interception procedures allow you to do. Um, and they often make, uh, you know, sudden moves around these aircraft and they just don't, they just, they don't behave in a safe manner. <laughs> now, later on top of this, you've got, they're trying to intercept a drone, right? Well, a drone does not have like a two-way communication thing to be able to talk to the Russian pilots. If the Russian pilots were following proper international law um, interception procedures, they were over international waters, which they should have been, you know, but to intercept, you communicate with the aircraft that you wanted to go somewhere else. Can't do that with a drone. And it's also entirely possible that because of the way sort of drone sensors operate, unless there was a, a U.S. or or sort of NATO radar ground station monitoring the situation um, or an air airborne controller aircraft monitoring the situation, that but that drone itself and the drone operator may not even know those jets are there because drones sort of fly through a, like visually they fly through a soda straw. So that's, that's an additional level of risk because, you know, I'm the Russian pilot. I don't even know if that drone is aware of me. That drone could turn and do anything just based off what the ground controller wants to do. And I don't know what that is because I can't communicate with it. But apparently if I'm a Russian fighter pilot, I don't care either. So th that goes into like the, the unsafe aspect of it, I think in pretty good detail. But then they did more, right? So unprofessional, they didn't follow normal interception procedures, um, most likely. Two, you know, they're following their normal unsafe, getting close, being very aggressive with it. Then, uh, so th then they were called out for being environmentally unsound, which is which is an interesting thing in here because apparently their um, first effort to uh, to bring down the drone was to dump fuel on it. And for the listeners at home, uh, we don't script these out, but we do block them in terms of the topics that we're going to go over. And when I first asked Ian Major Brown to comment on dumping fuel on from one flying object to another. That was where uh, we put in the, maybe we shouldn't swear so much during the episode uh, warning to ourselves. So this, this is the most edited version of Aviator, uh, Aviator Brown coming up. Yeah, this, I'm, I'm internally fired up, but I'm trying to, to put a filter on it. But so, so, but here's the thing, like they dumped fuel on it. Hard to know where to begin. One, you, you don't, there's no tactic for dumping fuel on another aircraft. That's not something that's in our flight manual as part of an interception deal. Usually you usually you dump fuel um, if there's an emergency. Uh, if, you, if you lose partial power to an aircraft, like you lose an engine, you dump fuel to reduce the weight of the, of the aircraft. Or, and I don't want to speak too much because I'm, again, helicopter pilot, not a jet pilot, but... There may be times where to, if your your aircraft might be fine, but if you're trying to like to rapidly accelerate or get a little bit more airspeed um, in the near term, you may dump fuel to improve the maneuverability of your aircraft. Because again, your aircraft is lighter; uh, it'll make it more agile if you're going into potentially a, like an air-to-air -air type thing, or if you think there's a threat from uh, from surface to air, you want your plane to be able to respond faster. So maybe you dump fuel then too. In general, though, when you dump fuel, again, there are procedures for when and how you do it. 
and you generally do it over at a higher altitude and when you're sure there is absolutely nothing underneath you. I would bet lots of money that the Russian pilots didn't care if there was anything underneath them, like civilian shipping, other aircraft, right? <laughs> Maybe even their own aircraft underneath there um, that were under. Pretty sure they didn't give a rat's ass about it. But to dump fuel onto another aircraft, to me, this is where we go. For, this is environment. So that was the environmentally unsound part, right? Like there are procedures for dumping fuel, which is inherently a, a toxic substance. And then you dump it on another aircraft. And this is where, like I said before, it's just stupid. It's f***ing stupid because, as I mentioned to you before we started recording, an aircraft engine, um, it's essentially a controlled explosion, right? It's got, It's already got fuel going into it, and you light that fuel on fire in a controlled fashion so that it turns all the gears inside it, generates the thrust that gets your aircraft to go. It's a controlled explosion. You introduce more fuel to it from a source that the fuel is not supposed to come to. Now you potentially get an uncontrolled explosion, and you haven't... You just don't know what that's going to do. So I'm like, I'm visualizing these Russian pilots getting like, and again, we talked about it. When you dump fuel at altitude and at a higher airspeed, it atomizes very quickly. So if you want that fuel to sort of be dense enough to affect the other aircraft's performance, you're going to have to get close to it for it to still be in a liquid form rather than aerosol. So I'm just picturing, you know, this Russian jet sort of coming down and above dumping fuel on the, on the Reaper to see what happens. And who is to say that that fuel goes into the intake, turns a controlled explosion into an uncontrolled explosion, blows up the Reaper engine, which blows up the Reaper fuel tank, which then you get a big fireball and who knows where that's going to go, you know, and you're close enough, part of that fireball is probably going to go into you. It astounds me how dumb, just dumb that is to do that and to attempt to do it multiple times, right? Like, the, according to the report, um, every time you're doing that, you're rolling the dice for just getting a big, big fireball that takes you out as well. Stupid. Um, and then that last point where apparently the fuel didn't work and they did something that damaged the propeller of the Reaper. Did they bump it with like, this is, I, again, I can't even fathom. Like I don't, you don't use your aircraft as a freaking bumper car. Right. But un unless they were, there was no indication that the Russian jets were shooting ordnance at the Reaper. So again, I just, I have this mental picture of Vladimir up there wiggling his sticks and then, you know, just using his wing to try and nudge the propeller. Again, inducing a giant spinny dynamic thing that's potentially slicing through your aircraft. It's dumb because you don't know where any, like say it generates a bunch of shrapnel when you do it. It could go into your airframe. It might not go into your airframe, but you don't know. And it's dumb. And that's why you don't deliberately physically like touch another aircraft when you do the interception. Anyway, I've been going on for a while now, but again, it's because I'm, I'm kind of fired up and thinking about the utter Sure. Dangerous. Yeah. The Russians, they do dangerous interceptions all the time. Got it. I know they don't care about the environment. Right. But from a pure self-preservation standpoint, I can't imagine what that pilot thought he was doing, that that was that was a good way to go about doing this and still have a chance of coming home to like, you know, high five your friends when you get back and be like, oh, I shot down, you know, killed the American aircraft. This is wonderful. Right. You know, you might have gone down with it. So. so Love your passion for aviation safety and, uh, <laughs> I, and uh, yeah, I, I, I actually, I was an aviation safety officer at one point in my flying career, which is partly why I'm fired up, but also I'm glad you enjoyed my Russian accent. Yeah. Ac accent work is good. Uh, we, we both share a passion for the theater. So I think, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out like, why is this happening? There's, there's the micro of basically the decision-making of that pilot and whatever, you know, whoever he was speaking to uh, at, at home base, um, whether he was directed to do so or basically was freelancing, um, you know, we can try to also then just assume what are the other scenarios, like what are the risks of what could have happened in order to think what might the Russians have wanted to have happen out of this? So obviously there's a pilot that's going up and is told there's a Reaper drone out there. We need to get rid of it. Um, whether it's, just as a symbol, like, you know, there's just like a US drone around, or that drone was getting close to something that's, you know, much more sensitive to, to Russian war interests. We can imagine that even if, so let's assume, you know, the, the plane made it home safely, the, uh, the drone did not. What if there was a midair collision that resulted in the explosion of basically like the fighter jet as well? At that point, Obviously, like the whatever the Russians were considering about safety on the ground, safety in the air, that doesn't matter. So if it had exploded, it would have immediately become the issue of today 
this week and perhaps even weeks from now. Recall a couple of months ago when the Ukrainians uh, accidentally shot down, uh, accidentally fired into uh, Poland. And what was the worldwide reaction when there was a chance that the Russians had fired a missile into a NATO country? That was serious in a way that the rest of the war had not been up to that point, even though obviously the war is very serious. So at this point, what we can imagine is that Russians were running a risk that included not just bringing down like an adversary uh, aircraft, but potentially willing to sacrifice one of their own jets and one of their own pilots in order to bring it down, which suggests to me just this is a total knee jerk reaction. Uh, again, this is breaking news, so we don't know any details. But my first thought was if the, if there was an ex mid air explosion, the Russians would have said the Black Sea does not belong to the United States. They should not have been there. They're at fault for having the drone that caused our pilot to have to go and remove it from our airspace, whether it's international or not, our airspace is just generally asserted. And so this would have been a mechanism to reframe international attention away from the, the lame uh, offensive that's happening right now, the grinding attrition around Bakhmut, all the general, also Russia has started to re-release all their, um, actual government budget data, so there's no good news coming out of that. All of those different things, none of which are good, would then immediately crystallize into one issue. America versus Russia, what's going to happen next? What's the battle of wills between Putin and Biden? What's America going to do? What's Russia uh, essentially going to assert thereafter? And that essentially would be something in which the Russians traditionally are much more comfortable because they've demonstrated not just over the past year, but over the past years and decades, they're willing to run the risk of, of like, like wider conflict, at least in the sense of rattling the cage when they don't anticipate the United States is gonna do much about it. So in that regard, but what would have happened at minimum is that international attention would have been focused on the threat Russia poses. And that essentially would have been great for Russia to have the world think about that when trying to assess what's happening in the Russia-Ukraine war. And so this is something, you know, we've seen the Russians are always willing to run risks. They only go through with it when they do believe um, that the risk of blowback is not too great. And ultimately, they obviously didn't think that this Ukraine war was going to turn into what it did. And so when we think about Russians running risks, we know that they're not attacking any of the, the munitions convoys into Ukraine. We also know that like NATO has not directly entered the fight. When the Russians brought up the potential uh, tactical nuclear weapons or attacks on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, President Biden, um, Pres of, uh, President Macron of France, and then Josep Borrell, who's the foreign policy chief of the EU, all said that um, the Western response would be uh, conventional and devastating. And the Russians have backed off nuclear threats from there. So perhaps what they're trying to do here is, again, just try and test where the line is and see what the U.S. will or will not do and try to establish that as a new normal in terms of um, making sure that they don't lose uh, whatever sort of air dominance they have over the northern Black Sea. Yeah. As, as So as you described that, I was getting, thinking back to the broadcast we did with Dan when we were talking about the the Chinese interceptions. And something that he brought up that uh, I, it's possible it applies here, too, is that it's the risk sort of the, the senior leadership might think it's running when it says things like go and be aggressive against a, a U.S. aircraft or drone, right? Like go go flex muscles, show that we're strong. It's entirely possible that in sort of the chain through which that communication is made down to the pilot, um, the, the pilots may not be given, they may be given little instruction or they may be given a different interpretation of what they think they're supposed to do, you know, which is, you know, they may interpret be aggressive and flex the muscle as like do something really bonkers and unsafe and and wild and crazy. That'll get their attention, right? The point was kind of like one of the points was it's possible that the, the message of go be strong did not mean go and try and and flood that thing out of the sky with your with your fuel tanks there there may have been a some context lost in between when uh when 
you know, maybe Putin sets out the rule of engagement in general about being stronger over international airspace and, you know, Dmitry being like, oh, let me dump fuel, see what happens, right? Um, sorry, I just, I can't, I can't help myself, but it's, th there may also be a, again, with that, that different risk cal calculus, there may also be, th and this kind of goes back into, again, like the echo chamber, the closed loop that's around the senior decision makers and this applied to the, the Chinese side too, which I mentioned to Dan, like we've seen over, not even over a decade, over 20 years of unsafe Chinese fighter jet interceptions in that area. And the thing I, I, I remember was like, you know, but before 9-11, like the thing that caught the world's attention was when a Chinese jet collided with a U.S. patrol aircraft that had to do an emergency landing into Hainan. I believe it killed the Chinese pilot, destroyed that aircraft outright and um, made for very dangerous landing for the U.S. aircraft. Had we not maybe had a 9-11, that might have been in the news a lot longer because that was a that was a big deal i remember when that happened but the the point was they continue to do these unsafe interceptions over and over and over again which one i think it indicates a certain either lack well, overall lack of skill and training in these pilots and how to do it properly but also like the senior leadership may may seem to think that their pilots are able to execute this and no one is telling them otherwise which which is very very dangerous because you may assume a much higher level of competence and training in your pilots than they actually have, right? You may think Russian pilots are the best in the world. Well, hey, it turns out nobody actually trained Dimitri on how to do a proper interception. So he's just like making stuff up as he goes along, see what happens. Because the only thing he was told was go, inter go intercept, show muscle, fly the flag. Maybe nobody told him. <laughs> Maybe he never read the International Flight Manual for how to do that. And nobody told him. Um, which again, it's a dangerous divergence, but it also leads you like, that's a hard risk calculus. I think maybe for us to understand what exactly risk calculus they're taking, if they're assuming better performance, better quality of their people than they actually have, because nobody's told them different. I, I mean, to other aspects of what's going on here, you know, the, it's possible they thought, um, you know, a, a way to sort of push that line, right. Is not going after um, crude U.S. aircraft, because we know there's all kinds of crude U.S. aircraft flying around that space, you know, from early warning aircraft to, I'm, I'm sure there are allied, you know, fighter jets that are very close by. I'm Like that whole Black Sea area, I'm sure, is highly, highly active in military aviation from all sides. But going after a drone, you're not risking NATO American lives. And sort of as we saw with, um, you know, when the, uh, the Iranians sort of spoofed a, um, a high value um, U.S. drone and sort of well, they stole it, basically, like made it go somewhere else. That's a very uh, aggressive thing to do, but there's no U.S. lives on the line, which changes what it means to escalate that. Because at the end of the day, you you lost a very expensive radio controlled airplane, but you didn't lose any lives. So I, I guess the sort of the Russian calculus could be we could do this, maybe get away with it. And anything they anything the other side does, they're the escalatory ones because they didn't need to respond because it was just a giant radio controlled plane, right? There were no lives. Um, but, but again, like this, this is the same logic what we observed over the first couple of years in, in Syria after Russia intervened there in 2015. One, it shifted, at least at that time, a lot of international attention away from Crimea and from the then faltering uh, Russian sponsored civil war or Russian sponsored insurgency against the Kiev government in Donbass and Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics. At that time, basically the, the Russians had met what their limits were without basically full-scale invasion. So they basically reframed away uh, from Ukraine to Syria. And when they're in Syria, and I think this is something that you know a lot better than, than I do, they were very aggressive um, and unsafe and unprofessional and unsound in terms of their um, interactions and deconflictions with uh, with basically U.S. and allied or U.S. and other adversarial uh, flying objects like planes and drones and whatever else, because they were coming from the position that fundamentally, if they have the whether granted by the Assad government or granted to themselves by virtue of just being like uh, Russians, that they can just make law as they see fit then essentially it's up to the more responsible uh basically like actor within that relationship to avoid deconfliction or to avoid conflict and to deconflict and so therefore what they can do is they can generate basically new norms of interaction as well as basically 
new rules of the road um, and basically new places for themselves to operate and to deny others to operate by virtue of just being more aggressive, being more reckless and being more irresponsible, but to do so in a way that challenges the other to keep risking their planes, their drones, uh, their crude, uh, their crew uh, or not. The logic of it, it th that that makes more sense to me, at least in the context of Syria, you know, where you could make an argument, however valid or not, that, you know, it's Syrian airspace. Syria asked us to be here. The rest of you are interlopers. You know, I, I'm do what I want to interlopers kind of thing. What I don't get here is like, you know, even if Russia wants to say, you know, where does the international airspace line stop D depending on where you know where you are and what altitude you're at like the the line is clear like there are there are parts of airspace that are simply general use international airspace almost kind of like international waters and it's i'd say it's even easier to understand the international waters because there are very few sort of territorial disputes over the air above you you know as compared to sort of who controls what island or how far your economic exclusion zone goes in the water like that air, airspace is airspace and the sort of who has authority and control over what altitudes of airspace is, is very long established. And um, I, I, I ask our listeners to correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of a, a specific airspace, you know, territorial dispute just because there's, it's just, it's just, just a different environment. And there's, you know, there are no resources up in airspace to fight over. So there's sort of less reason to, to complain about where your airspace stops and starts. But all that aside, I'm just I, I don't under I sort of understand the, the logic if say something catastrophic had happened and and you know the Reaper had blown up and taken a Russian jet with it. Even if Russia, you know, Putin or his, his friends might think that that gives them more currency to blame, uh, you know, the U.S. as an aggressor. Uh, again, going back to what I just mentioned earlier, that airspace over the Black Sea, if, if maybe not the case before the war, but since the war started. I'm confident that is some of the most heavily monitored airspace on the face of the planet right now. So if if Russia wanted to make the claim that, you know, either the drone was acting unsafely or was in in inappropriate airspace, I guarantee you it would take about five seconds for U.S. and all the NATO countries around there to sort of like show the receipts, you know, pull the radar track, show all the information, be like, nope, this is where this is exactly where it was. This is what it was doing. And oh, by the way, we can they could probably even play back radio voice radio intercepts to determine whether or not the Russian aircraft made any attempt to verbally contact the drone before doing the interception, which, oh, by the way, is also part of any international um, airspace interception procedure as you attempt to communicate before you start doing things toward the aircraft if it's not listening to you. So again, I don't, I don't under, understand what benefit they think they would um, get if something really catastrophic had happened because it would, all the evidence would be easily shown out against them that they were the ones who were being escalatory. But again, who cares? If, if I, I mean, I, 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 I'm I, like, I'm truly asking that question, like outside of internal politics, maybe who cares? Like, who do they think is going to care about a, you know, trying to sell the line that it was, it, it was an unmanned aircraft. <laughs> that was the aggressor here and not a, a human crewed um, fighter aircraft. Like who's going to buy that? Yeah. I mean, I think it just goes into the point about not just risk tolerance or risk acceptance, but irresponsibility acceptance in order to create essentially a potential crisis that would bring the United States and Russia to a point where things can only get resolved at the presidential level. And that in that sense is you know, like like other elements of like Russia's toxic behavior over the last year or years, you could say is they would rather have negative attention than to be ignored. And this is a great way to get negative attention because they'll go on TV, you know, I'm sure right now it's, it's evening in Moscow as we speak. And I'm sure tonight's talk shows are all about just, you know, Russians defending Russian airspace, Russians ensuring the successful prosecution of special military operation and essentially the irresponsibility of NATO and how awful America is. And this is a great storyline for that because at the end of the day, nothing bad happened to them. And it's not 100% clear whether anything bad will happen to them. So I, I'm, I'm a little bit more sort of like wary that, about whether this might be um, something we'll see more and more 
for the Russians to just essentially keep testing how much we want to stay involved and whether this will be something that they can basically meme into existence of a, of, you know what, there is a real and potential chance of conflict or conflictual interactions with the Russians. Maybe let's not do that. Let us deconflict first. And I, and I just, you know, that's the energy that I got as soon as I saw the headline. Yeah. I mean, I guess we'll see, right? I, I can't say I, I understand their risk calculus or that, you know, that they think it's going to go the way they go and like nothing has gone the way they thought it would go. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised that like, they might think this will go one way and it may go another way. To me, there's a uh, very strong reason, you know, you know, Black Sea is not U.S.'s, you know, airspace backyard, right? But it is for everybody who lives around there. And I would imagine that all of the countries that border that who are not Russia right now have a very strong interest in having, you know, freedom of international flight, you know, of using proper use of international airspace as something that is being enforced. Drawing a line in the sky, it's hard, um, and it's hard to imagine, like, why Why does that matter? But, you know, if if the whole point of this support is sort of like enforcing international norms and and procedures and laws and things like that you know like airspace is part of that i would imagine like losing a drone is not great like i looked up the price tag um it's not a cheap drone <laughs> it's about 30 million dollars um and change <laughs> not count like not counting whatever um special electronics it might have had on it you know but the, the nice thing about drone is they're a lot cheaper than crude aircraft okay i said i'm gonna send another one tomorrow kind of thing right maybe i send two just to make a point that um, that kind of you know unsafe and reckless behavior in international airspace is not going to be challenged. And I don't, you know, I say I as sort of like U.S. slash NATO. I have lots and lots of drones. I don't necessarily have to risk my own life and limb to make the point of that I'm going to continue to operate in international airspace and and follow those laws because again, drones are expensive. They're not cheap, but there's no human life on board. And uh, th I, this raises, you know, I don't have a really good answer to it, but it's something that I think people first started really thinking about when Iran spoofed that drone and captured it. What, what is the escalatory ladder for, for unmanned systems? Because they are specifically not crude. There are no human people on top of it. So uh, you know, I, I know there were questions in the past, like, do we, do we do something to Iran because they took our drone? It was an even more expensive drone than the Reaper, right? Um, Reaper is fairly... I don't know, it's a fairly, fairly conventional um, system that's out there. No, nobody's going to go to war over losing a drone. But knowing that, you can expend potentially more drones and say that you're not looking at escalating and doing stuff because you're not, you're not risking human lives. So well, I guess we'll see how this all plays out. But there, I think there's, there are more variables at play than, uh, than I think the Russian leadership maybe necessarily thought of. And again, the, <laughs> I think that the, Interesting thing that I, I don't know the, the Russian leadership hasn't seemed to figure out yet, but it's the whole uh, FAFO bleep around and find out if they keep messing around with international, uh, internationally recognized airspace and territories outside of Ukraine. Um, they may find out some lessons that they don't necessarily want to learn in terms of how strongly those international norms and laws will be enforced. Keep an eye out on this one. Yeah. Um, all right. So we, we actually spent, I think, a lot more time than we planned to on that one subject. Uh, but an, another headline that popped up today, which we don't, I don't think we really know enough about, except maybe some of the messaging. But uh, there's a story about how now uh, women prisoners are being recruited from Russia to go serve the motherland in the special glorious military operation. So, uh, and I, again, relatively new development, don't not a whole lot of details on it. But what do you think some of the, the implications of this are and where do you think these people would be used? Well, we, we, we've seen over the last number of weeks that uh, Wagner has had its access to Russian prisons, uh, which again, just like, let's take a step back. The suicide squad uh, basically offer to people, you're in prison, you're gonna be here for a long time. You wanna basically gamble the next six months that you'll see that the six months after that, um, that that's where we are right now. And so, Eventually, we'll we'll get the data on how how many uh, prisoners uh, Wagner was basically able to spring uh, from behind bars in order to go and uh, fight in the conflict. But it's probably somewhere in the like mid tens of thousands. 
in recent weeks, obviously, as Wagner was getting this influx of uh, fighters to basically engage in human wave attacks, and this is, you know, the, the mechanism by which they've been able to hold the line in Bakhmut, and basically, even though the town itself is more or less destroyed at that point, keep taking more, uh, you know, square meters from it, uh, from the Ukrainians. And he, here's the thing, Prigozhin, Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, again, not a friend of the pod, but someone we, we mention often, uh, when he was going, getting out there, when he was getting all of these uh, convicts uh, from prison, and he was making a number of statements in the, the Russian press, he was making a number of internet videos, he was getting out there on social media, and he was really presenting himself as the one person who's able to make a difference in the special military operation. And he was very explicit that the people that he was distinguishing himself from uh, was the Russian military both the actual uniform uh, side, as well as the civilian uh, Ministry of Defense. And during this time, as he was going uh, forward, he was putting out the pictures of, you know, him in, uh, you know, captured towns, pictures of him, him in salt mines in Solodar, uh, pictures of him just doing the thing. And obviously saying, you know, if anyone's senior putting themselves at risk, it's only me. You never see Shoy go out here. You never see Gerasimov out here. I'm the guy who's doing it. And so in recent weeks, um, he's also started to complain that he's not getting the amount of ammunition, the amount of artillery that he used to be getting. And what it seems is that over the course of the last few weeks, Prigozhin tried to put himself forward as the guy who is going to deliver victory for Russia and embarrass basically the other people um, who have been in government for decades at this point. And that, if anything, will look back as his fatal mistake, his pre falling out the window, uh, his pre errant friendly fire artillery strike is reframing who's doing more and going against people whose chief talents on earth are bureaucratic infighting. And so when they, uh, so when the Ministry of Defense shut off his access to prisons, he apparently has now gone to female prisons, to women's prisons, and taken 1,100 female prisoners to go join uh, Wagner. Now, in terms of what they might be doing, is within traditional, like Soviet, you know, military gender roles, they're probably medics. Um, women traditionally have not been engaged in combat operations, and they traditionally don't actually go to the front line all that much, except as to uh, serve in the medical roles. And so we can imagine that's more or less what they'll be doing uh, at this point. But again, if Wagner's starting to run out of, you know, basically the men, eventually they'll give weapons to whoever is mobile. And that might be the, um, the, the female uh, convicts uh, as well. Yeah, you know, as you mentioned that, I, uh, a couple of instances struck my mind where, you know, when, when things are hard enough, um, you know, the Russians slash, slash past previous Soviets, you know, would have no issues giving the Russian women who traditionally they've kept away from it, you know, weapons to go fight for the motherland or fatherland or whatever. You know, I'm thinking back into World War II where you know, I know there were Russian, uh, there were women who were in combat as snipers and other roles. And I, one instance I know only because I've, I've seen a, I've read a graphic novel about the history of it. Actually, I've read a couple books about the history of it. And there's a, actually a war game in design about it, but the Night Witches, uh, the, the Russian female, all female bomber squadron in World War II that were used, employed nighttime only against, uh, you know, Nazi German attacks in there. Although the maybe if, if it ever gets to the point with these female prisoners in the Wagner group, we may see if they repeat what they did with the Soviet women back then, which is, yeah, we'll give you weapons, but we're going to give you like the absolute crappiest ones because the night witches were given obsolete, unmaneuverable biplanes, um, which uh, were in a fair fight would have been no match whatsoever for russian or sorry russian um nazi sort of ground-based air defenses and, and run and russian or again nazi aircraft um although the the soviet women to their credit they found some innovative ways of using those obsolete aircraft uh, which is why they got the nickname of night witches uh, but that's a different story we don't have to get into here because we've all been going long but yeah i would I, yeah i would not be surprised if they reach a point where we start hearing about female convict wave attacks going on in and around Bakhmut to finally try and take that city. Uh, fun and adventures in, uh, in staffing. Yeah, there's, there's talent management and then there's talent management. Uh, so 
I think, you know, one of the, one of the other things that we can sort of take from that is, you know, what is the future of Wagner here? Prigozhin, I, I believe it, when this is all said and done, we'll see that his attempt to break through and create a, a sense of that he's so invaluable and that Wagner is so invaluable as to create a direct connection between himself and Putin and to basically do an end around, end around, around the entire, um, you know, defense establishment was the moment in which the defense establishment maybe identified that he is not a good, uh, not a good rival to have. And let's just maybe um, take him out before he causes too much trouble. In previous episodes, um, you know, even starting from a number of months ago, we talked about what happens after this war is over. And one of the things that was at least very clear to us is that these Wagner fighters will have done horrible things, will have seen horrible things, and, and will have had horrible things happen to them. They will go back to Russia with their weapons. They'll go back to Russia with a without a sense of respect for human life. And that essentially at best, these are people who are going to terrorize their own families and, um, you know, communities. And at worst, they're going to do that plus essentially form, you know, the next wave of organized crime in Russia and the next wave of perhaps the nucleus of uh, private militaries and basically private security companies in Russia that are willing to do whatever it takes if and when central government starts to collapse in Russia and you suddenly have both wealthy individuals as well as firms looking for armed um, support uh, at all times. A thing to note about this before sort of thinking about Wagner and Bakhmut is that Russian new Russian legislation as of last week has now legalized private security companies um, that can be attached directly to a firm, like a firm, not just like contracts with, you know, XYZ Security Corp, but the firm itself can create its own armed security. You know, uh, one of the jokes on on Twitter was, you know, you know, the first Gazprom uh, guards division uh, is something that we might see. Uh, but ultimately, who are going to be the sort of people who leave Ukraine, don't have many skills, but are willing to use violence if and when appropriate or if and when uh, the opportunities are there. That's essentially, the, you know, the future. And perhaps, and so what we've seen around Bakhmut is Wagner keeps holding the line, but they keep getting chewed up day in, day out. They're not getting the artillery that they're previously used to. Uh, the, the Ministry of Defense is saying that they're, because the offensive is now happening, um, Wagner is getting treated like everyone else because there's essentially there's a much greater need for artillery across the line and other sorts of, um, you know, uh, munitions and other sorts of, um, you know, just general equipment across the line. But I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility, given what we've seen of the Russians and their disregard for, you know, the preservation of human life. The Russian Ministry of Defense might be thinking it's great if Wagner can hold Bakhmut, but if they basically get destroyed, decimated, eliminated as a, a fighting force between now and that point, not too many tears are going to be shed. Yeah, I think. And uh... Looking back to sort of the, the court politics, I can see that as a you've got this squeaky wheel there with Prigozhin and his Wagner group that's not reflected well on the, uh, you know, at least on the, the bureaucratic elements of the regime. So you put them in a catch 22 position, right? Like, hey, you guys, you think you're all that you go ahead and you go take it right. Go take the city. Show us what you've got. And then but you don't give them anything. So. Hey, if they succeed, um, great. You've got the city that you wanted this whole time and you've you've gotten your military objectives on the battlefield. Um, if you don't, you essentially grind up and destroy that organization as an effective fighting force, which removes them from taking further like future battlefield glory, um, if that ever happens. And then you can <clears throat> say that you can show, hey, this guy, he couldn't take the city. He's really not all that. And all of his whining, complaining about artillery, that's just excuses for his failure. So, you know, from a, from a very cynical perspective, I can understand there's incentive for the Ministry of Defense both to not help them and put them right at the forefront. Not the cuddliest uh, people we're talking about here. No, it's like hugging a crocodile. It's the, like the thing that is like, 
I mean, since I don't come from like a military background, but over the last number of years, obviously been in a military environment as well as getting to know more people across, you know, the US and NATO defense enterprise. And the key, and before, and the like years ago, I lived for a number of years in Russia as well. So I have this sort of like comparative perspective. And if there's anything that really sort of like, when you boil it down to like, it's like base, base elements within the US and and NATO, but like the US like military establishment, the defense enterprise, one of the key sort of like watchwords is lethality. What can we do to be more lethal against the adversary? How can we be more efficient? How can essentially we be um, more effective? And all these sorts of things, you know, all the money, all the training, the war gaming, everything is meant to essentially prepare the US allied and partner militaries that in case of crisis, we're all ready to be as lethal as possible against the adversary. And when you look at this in terms of like what's going on on the Russian side, it's they'd love to do that. They'd love to be more lethal against the adversary. But first and foremost, they're not going to let any internal rivals rise further, farther, or faster more than themselves. And they're willing to see Russian citizens die by the tens of thousands hundreds of thousands perhaps when this is all done. One, just to make one guy happy, but two, just to ensure that if success were to come, it only comes in the way that, you know, a couple individual, uh, you know, decision makers in the Russian Ministry of Defense and the Russian Armed Forces are willing to allow it to happen. And like that to me is just, that's like a through line that you could put probably hundreds of years. Um, I'd rather, I'd love to win, but I'd rather make sure that, you know, the neighbor doesn't do better than me. Yeah, I, I've said this before. It's something I don't, I don't claim to un understand because to me, the idea that like jockeying for, you know, position to be, you know, five feet closer as a courtier to the, the throne of power when, you know, this war, this special military operation, whatever you call it, when you, when you say this is an existential you know, threat to your country that you're facing, but the jockeying comes first. I just, you know, again, you know, just don't understand it. And it, it reminds me, and I don't know if I've told you this joke before, but this is like one of the first, one of the first jokes I learned when I was learning Russian. There is a, an old farmer out in the fields and he has led a, a Christ-like, a God-like existence. He has always done his work. He's always been kind to others. He has always prayed. He has always been a man for everybody else. And he's out there tilling the fields and out of the heavens, the, the clouds move apart. The Lord comes down and says, Ivan, you are a wonderful person. You have lived your life for others in my own image. And for your service, I won't even wait for you to get to heaven to reward you, but I will give you heaven on earth. I will grant you whichever wish that you want. And to show that I also appreciate how much you do for others, whatever I bestow upon you, I will give double to your neighbor. And Ivan sort of just stands there and he thinks deeply and he looks directly at the Lord and he says, Lord, take out my eye. No, you haven't shared that one before, but that tracks perfectly in line with other other. Russian jokes, quote unquote, that I've heard where you, like you, you laugh and you cry at the same time. That and I'll, joke I'll, might be a thousand years old. Fair warning. Yeah, I know. It, it sounds like something that that has a, a, a long pedigree, but uh, no, that that's a new one. Um, not quite the same sort of dad jokes that we've been telling around the spaces here in recent weeks. So I don't know if I'm going to throw that out at the next staff meeting, but it, that really does sort of capture the the gallows humor. <laughs> Uh, if you can call it that, uh, that comes out of the culture. And it, it actually kind of reminds me, I'll give credit to one of your compatriots um, in the in the Russia field, Michael Kaufman, um, who now I know you know, because you said he was at your wedding and I didn't know that. Um, I should have known all the, the Russian folks have been hanging, you know, pretty close lately. But in his last podcast, he came back um, uh, from visiting pretty close to Bakhmut, actually. I think he, he may have even gone to the the environs, but it, it was sort of revisiting like the performance of the Russian military and where, where, if how at all, they seem to be learning organization or not. And, and this, this exact thing, like 
the court politics taking precedence over effective military operations. And the joke was something like a Russian who has served in the Russian military does not laugh at the circus since they've seen it up close. Once we're at the joke stage of the, of the episode, I think it's time to wrap it up. Yeah. And we had intended on focusing this on Bakhmut and I don't think we've spent more than a couple of seconds on it. Not something I really want to sort of shoehorn in at the end. So maybe we look at doing another one here pretty close so we can talk about that. Just one, one last point. Uh, I was just checking. Russian minister, uh, defense ministry <clears throat> uh, has made a statement. The key, the key sense here is uh, as a result of quick maneuvering around 9.30 a.m. Moscow time, the MQ-9 drone went into an unguided flight with a loss of altitude and collided with the water. Very poor showing of international flight rules for that drone to go ahead and go uncontrolled and crash into the water. What did that water ever do to the drone? Won't someone think of the water? They got to say what they got to say, right? But I, 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 I'm, fr I'm fairly confident, even though they did not manage to blow up their own aircraft by dumping fuel onto another one, um, I, would, I would expect in the next day or two, we'll probably get some of that sort of radar traffic, um, you know, air traffic control type stuff to show exactly what was going on and who was doing what to remove any doubt about who was not following the rules of the road here. There you have it, everyone. Been one of our longer episodes, I think, so we'll definitely uh, look at wrapping it up here. Didn't intend to make this into a, a hip pocket class on aviation safety. So to our audience, apologies for going a little bit overboard there, but it's one of these things is, you know, late breaking news as we call it, right? But starting to maybe see things now year on or so into the war that we didn't necessarily see before and have to think about if we see this again, what are the implications? Um, because it's always the same thing with the Chinese interceptions that go on and even um, Russian aircraft and whether it's jets or, or some of the larger bombers, they regularly like go through other people's airspace, whether it's up in Alaska or up near the Arctic Circle with the NATO allied countries to test the limit. And it's always I read these things. And I'm like, this is one pilot being a second too slow. Right. Or, you know, maybe an aircraft throttle is not quite as um finely tuned as it was supposed to be in the maintenance. All it would take is a millisecond for this to be joking about, you know, the bonkers approach of dumping fuel to something really bad happening and having some unintended consequences spiraling in a very different direction. So like we laugh, but like every, every single time these things happen, there are some possible branches that are not great for anybody. And it'd be really nice if the folks who were doing the aggressive, unsafe, environmentally unsound and incompetent aviating took that to heart a little bit more, but we can't seem to really count on that. So, you know, fingers crossed that the folks on our side who can control what we can control are still doing all those right things to make sure that these incidents don't turn into something really bad. Uh, well, you all again, thank you uh, again very much for your time. We'll figure out when we can actually do a focus on Bakhmu because that's what we planned on doing today and didn't get to it. And uh, again, to our audience, I uh, hope you, we at least took you through the late breaking headlines today and we are gonna do a deeper dive into Bachman here in the near future because it is a, a battle, a siege, a friggin' meat grinder, whatever you wanna call it, um, that has taken a lot of attention, fo uh, focus of attention, it's consumed a lot of resources. There have been sufficient incremental gains kind of around it that as a tenable, defensible position, it's, it's looking not great. Um, so we do wanna talk about it, but we will save that for another time. Pleasure Ian, as right. always. Yeah, me too, you all. Take care, and we'll do this again soon. Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Crewland community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube, or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support, and we'll see you on the next episode.